In the antebellum period, the American economy was witnessing a sea change. The seeds of this economic change were being sown in the agricultural sector of America, where from arose the American brand of capitalism. But the pace of economic change quickened after the Civil War and eventually set the character of the economy as we know it today. Inventions and discoveries paved the way for revolutionary changes post-Civil War. Between 1860 and 1900, 76,000 patents have been recorded in the United States Patent Office. Out of that, quite a number of patents were taken out for agricultural sector, which gradually made it more machine intensive. One of the earliest automated machines was the cotton gin invented by Eli Whitney in 1793. It was designed to separate raw cotton fibers from seeds and other foreign materials prior to baling and marketing. It enabled one person to do the work previously done by 50 hand pickers, an efficiency that spurred the rapid spread of cotton plantations throughout the southern United States. This was followed by another epoch-making contraption invented by John Deere, who made the self-scouring steel plough a remarkable improvement upon the old cast iron ploughs. By 1855, Deere's factory sold more than 10,000 such ploughs. Then came another epoch-making machine known as the harvester and twine combined. Cyrus Hall McCormick, a 22-year-old Virginian, invented the reaper in 1881, and Obit Hussey invented the twine binder that would bind the stack of crops into decent packages with twine. In 1877, the Swedish inventor Carl Gustav Patrick de Laval introduced a high-speed centrifugal cream separator. Such innovations not only took away the pains from individual peasants, but also ushered in an era of farm mechanization on the soils of America. Further, in the post-Civil War era, genetically advanced crops were invented. These played a very important role in boosting agricultural growth in America. Using knowledge of plant genetics, they found out two crops, Kubanka, a wheat variety from Mexico, and Kharkov, a corn variety from Russia, both of which were rust resistant and could also withstand weather beating. By genetic processing, their codes were taken out and regenerated so that those could be easily available in the United States. Further, the farm scientists invented the method of producing pestilent and locust resistant genetic crops, thereby substantially reducing the threat of crop loss which loomed heavily earlier. Apart from discoveries and inventions, Dr. Chittabrotu Palit points out some other reasons for the agricultural revolution. The United States agricultural land was added. It is estimated that in 1860 there were 3 million agricultural farms. By 1900 there were uh, 60 million agricultural farms. So you can gauge the dimension of the available arable lands from 3 million in 1860 to 60 million uh, arable farms at the end of the day in 1900. So that was so much of addition of land to agriculture that was there. Population wise also there were 30 million new tillers available in United States and areas which were known for their aridity such as Dakotas Wyoming, Montana, Nevada, Arizona, these are all uh, dry lands, high and dry lands, but they all become arable 
because the efforts of these people, the new techniques, the new machines, they all yielded crop of different kinds. Both ways, there was a domestic, that is internal migration from east to west and fresh waves of migration from the old world to the new. Both ways, so many idle hands were available for this kind of stupendous agriculture, even by machine, so much was needed. So land was there, people were also there. So because of these reasons, there was an agricultural revolution in the United States. On an average, the production went up by uh, three times. That means 300 percent rise in production. Call it wheat, wheat which was in 1860 250 million bushels of wheat jumped up to 655 million bushels of wheat by 1900. If you call it corn, corn was about half or one, one billion tons of uh, corn maximum. That went up to 3-4 billion tons of corn. If you come to bales of cotton, that was also a, that took a giant leap at the same time. Six million bales of cotton were, uh, were produced by, from two million at the bottom in 1860 to six billion bales of cotton by 1900. So that gives an idea of how much productivity went on. So they all went up by 300 percent or three times. Uh, in terms of production. So it was a colossal production, we can say. And uh, that made America I come to that point that America came to become a land of plenty. Now that so much of production was there, they would be sold and naturally the, the country would become richer. By agriculture, not only you become self-sufficient in food, but at the same time, you become richer at the same time. And uh, because you become richer, there is a rural surplus. If you have a rural surplus, naturally, what do you do with this surplus? Apart from raising your standard of living, you industrialize. When you have industries, naturally, the rural manpower surplus also switches over from agricultural labor to industrial labor. That also happens. Because after some time, after mechanization in agriculture, many people become surplus. That is called rural manpower surplus. So why would they go? Then a stream of industries come and they are converted into industrial proletariat. Immediately they become industrial labor. In this way, they are complementary. Agricultural revolution and industrial revolution are complementary. Without the first one, the second one does not really germinate or flourish. Good thing was that uh, industrialization could take place. That is there. Bad thing was that the charm of olden, olden life, the charm of pastoral life of the United States, the individuality, the identity of life was totally lost. So they were virtually, we can say, the individual farmer was sacrificed at the altar of industry. That had happened. They became martyrs of industrial revolution. Country Road, Take Me Home, the famous song as you know. The Country Road, Take Me Home, home was that farm, farmhouse. That farmhouse was no longer there. The whole country had become a giant farm where bulldozers uh, had their play, harvesters had their play. And every single action which uh, a man used to do he used to feel an identity with the soil. Soil was their mother, but that was separate. Now for uh, planting the crop, now reaping the crop, harvesting the crop, packing the crop, everywhere there was a machine placing you. So that individual identity was totally lost. And it is, life became so crass, so mechanical. No, no pastoral, charm of pastoral life was left anymore. So that was one of the evil consequences. Out of these embers, we would see that peasant movements came up. The first peasant movement that we can recall in American history of this period 
is known as Granger movement. This is a social movement. It is not so much a political movement as such. It is a social movement. Main purpose was to break down the isolation of the farmer in the wilderness. Now strange people had come to different places and they were uh, slaves to the machine. They had no personal life, no charm. There is a monotony, there is a monotony of their life. And uh, they were both stiff. And therefore, they wanted some relaxation, some social life somewhere under the sun. And Kelly's patron's husbandry provided that. Oliver Hudson Kelly is considered the father of the order of patrons of husbandry more commonly known as the Grange. In 1864, Oliver Kelly joined the United States Bureau of Agriculture as a clerk. While working, he felt the need to rally the American farming community around in an effort to rebuild the country, especially her agricultural sector. On November 15, 1867, he set up an organization called the Grange with a view to placing American agriculture on a more solid footing than before. He was the first secretary of this organization until he resigned in 1878. Kelly died in 1913 in Washington, D.C. Oliver Kelly's formula was that you have one unit of Grange in each place of this in these far-flung territories. And around the grains, there'll be a lot of social activity. Like they said that they would have a library. They would have some kind of adult education there. Library would keep newspapers also. So those days there were no television, but they had newspapers and books all right. And they would have cultural programs time to time. And then they would publish pamphlets and periodicals guiding agriculture and guiding social life. They would publish a lot of that kind of literature, pastoral literature for that purpose. Then they would arrange big picnics. Picnics were very colorful. Village fairs were very colorful. And people from distant lands would come. So Granger movement ultimately not only became a Western movement, it became a national movement. It was so popular, so many people came here. And then they gradually organized some economic programs also, like agricultural cooperatives, health cooperatives, seed cooperatives, etc., etc. So these cooperatives also became very popular. And they felt united. The farmers organized. In textbooks you see that this chapter is called Farmers Organized. But they organized themselves. And there was no politicking, no political party had come. No Republican, no Democrats, no uh, Free Soil Party, no no political party had come. They themselves were doing it, socializing with each other. And if you had one grange, then another grange would join with you. There are several granges, then the cooperatives would be there. So in this way, it is a nationwide movement, ultimately. The best writer is, of course, J.S. Buck, who has written on this. Or if you go back to such classics like Nevin says, Emergence of Modern America, or H.K. Faulkner's remarkable book, Social and Political History of the United States. There you get a good description of what had happened. But Bach is by far the best local history. So there you have the total impression of the Granger movement. The Granger movement failed owing to its non-political stance. It made the supporters of pastoral life realize that actually a political third front was needed to preserve the rights of small farmers and tillers. Thus, in the 1890s, the populist movement appeared on the American political horizon. In the election of 1896, the prairie boy William Jennings Bryan was the presidential candidate from the Greenback Party another name for the populist party. Pitted against him was Grover Cleveland, the conservative Republican. William Jennings Bryan was a very famous orator. His Omaha speech is very famous. You sacrifice the nation on a cross of gold. 
he was criticizing the gold standard of the industrialists, capitalists, that the that gold currency was the prevalent currency, which the farmers did not earn so much. They wanted silver currency for easier circulation among the uh, farmers. So it was a fight between silver and gold. He was championing uh, silver against gold standard. So once again, the old question of tariff, old question of banking, old, old question of currency, all these came up one by one. And that they perennially pointed out that the West was being neglected for the benefit of the East. They also harped on that question. So the populist movement comes. They wanted a lot of what we can call decentralization, defederalization. They wanted silver currency. They wanted um, lower tariff for their co uh, agricultural commodities. They wanted representation in the state legislature and also in the federal uh, Congress and Senate. They demanded the also another thing, sub-treasury system, that they always ran short of money for agriculture. And therefore they wanted that only federal, uh, federal um, bank will not do. They must have the regional banks too, at least the sub-treasury system, so that they could also draw upon that. Because the federal bank, Bank of the United States, was in the clutches of the uh, industrial capitalists. So they wanted a sub-treasury system in their own states, backed by the center. But they wanted those things. So in this way, they all wanted that their interest should be preserved as best as it could. And to do that, they naturally entered politics. So it's a third party entry for the first time between Democrats and Republicans. And they had a political agenda, clear political agenda that we want this, 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 that is there. And they had very prominent leaders also. Brian was a definitely a million dollar baby. But there were others as well who are as good. So now it was quite an e even match between the industrial America and agricultural America. Even match. Both of them had proper agenda. Both of them had proper leaders. Both had huge following, huge following. Now the country had to decide. That was destiny was decided in the election of 1896. Nobody even imagined that against William Jennings Bryan, Grover Cleveland would win the election, who was a timid, coward, uh, conservative uh, Republican. Nobody thought that uh, Grover Cleveland would... He had already been elected once before. This was the second term. Everyone thought that the colorful uh, William Jennings Bryan would emerge as victorious. And there will be some correction to uh, industrial excesses in America. Now, you can ask me, why such a decision was made by the public? I would think the main factor behind this was that loss of the frontier, the land of opportunity. In 1890, when the frontier was gone, there was no more land to go to. United States people, people of the United States decided that they had to depend on industries and so forth. Agriculture would not really feed them anymore. They had to go industrial. Only industry can give them prosperity. Agriculture, the days of agriculture had been numbered. So 1890, loss of frontier, last frontier, that was possibly the main issue. And because of this, Grover Cleveland had won the election. There's no other. I would conclude at this stage by saying that to my mind, I would support Norman Polak, who is considered to be one of the new left historians of the United States on this question. And he also wanted to say that which was first, your industry or your people? Industry for people or people for industry? If you have that kind of a situation, then you would like to say people before industry. But capitalists, were, they were so dehumanized that they only wanted to have industry at the cost of the people. So this was not correct. I would say that to keep an economy viable, a society viable, the agriculture sector should be kept intact 
improved as well. And the, popul the message of the Populist Party cannot be lost sight of. That has to be very much uh, retained. And by populist, you know, the word populist today is a denigrating word, means uh, rebel, rebel politics. But the American Populist Party was not really a rebel. They, actually, the name should have been Popular Party, People's Party. Sometimes uh, the leaders of the Populist Party said that we are the People's Party against the plutocrats. That is the correct, uh, correct interpretation. Plutocrats were these industrial capitalists. The, our party is a People's Party against the plutocrats. There was some imbalance going on in the United States. That has to be corrected. So populist spirit must be kept up, as Norman Polak had said. And I, I agree with that, and I would like to end this lecture on that uh, spirit.